Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry that we are a bit late because of some technical problems, but welcome to the first seminar of 2022 from Riot Defense Club Rotterdam. The Riot Club is an initiative that is entirely early career researchers led. We host weekly seminars that aim to raise awareness and provide training in reproducible, interpretable, open and transparent science. Uh, Riot Club Rotterdam started in February 2020 and we just celebrated our second anniversary last week. Um, we would like to thank you, our wonderful audience, and also our amazing team, Anna, Ilza, Luisa, Milan, Somaya, and Georgina. Thanks for making everything happen. And you can see in our website that we have a fantastic set of speakers and an event lined up. And please check out our next speakers on the slides. And our events are entirely free and open to anyone. If you cannot make a particular event or would like to keep track of upcoming events, uh, please check our website, Twitter, OSF and YouTube channel, and we'll post a link later. And you can also subscribe to our mailing list. Uh, finally, we're currently recruiting new members who want to join us. Uh, if you're interested in spreading open research, you want to have some wonderful collaboration experience with your, with your colleagues and uh, you want to give back to the community by organizing the sessions, please um, send us an email and let's have a chat. And uh, then just a bit of housekeeping before we introduce our speaker. Uh, we host our event on Microsoft Team Live Events, which has a fantastic auto uh, subtitling feature. And you can ask your questions via, via the Q&A message box. These will be moderated by Lorenza, Elizabeth and I during and after the talk. Um, OK, let's move to the talk. Uh, our speaker for today is Professor Hall. Dr. Hall is a professor emeritus with the School uh, of Public Administration, University of uh, Victoria in Canada. And he is the co-chair of the UNESCO chair in community based research and social responsibility in higher education in a joint partnership with the Society for Part Participatory Research in Asia. Its current focus is on building research capacity in the Global South and the excluded North in the field of community-based research. Professor Hall has been associated with the development of the theory and the practice of participatory research since the early 1970s when he was working in Tanzania. And today, he's going to share with us the development of participatory research, principles of knowledge, democracy, and the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Okay, Professor Hall, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. I guess it's afternoon for many of you. Morning for, uh, for me. Um, so let me just move to the next slide. So you may be wondering where, uh, where I am. Uh, this morning, and uh, let me move this up. Anyway, uh, what you find here is the <clears throat> the map of uh, of an island. We call it these days in colonial words. We call it Vancouver Island. Um, uh, this is the I live on the the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. These are the original peoples of this island, and uh, the the uh, the Esquimalt, the Songhees, and the Husanich, uh, First Nations, as we say here in Canada. And you can see this island, um, it's quite a large island. Um, it's about, uh, oh, it's about 600 kilometers from where I live on the bottom all the way up to the top. And then you can see in the small map uh, that we're on the west coast of Canada on the Pacific Ocean. Um, the topic I want to talk to you today about uh, about a deep ah, come on now now I don't want to doesn't want to move <laughs> oh my goodness I'm having trouble this morning with this teams this doesn't seem to be working there we go I got it okay I want to talk to you this morning about um, the uh, open science uh, decolonization of knowledge and uh, participatory research um, I I think that one place to start with is Starting with ourselves, um, in order to understand uh, colonization, decolonization, um, we, we have to interrogate ourselves because each of us um, is has been shaped to some degree 
um, by the by by the colonization of knowledge, by the uh, by a situation historically where and, uh, a particular form of knowledge, uh, Euro Euro European or Eurocentric knowledge, um, has uh, acquired a, a dominant uh, status uh, in the world of of academia in the world of research and science, and so I think it's important to start. Um, thinking about ourselves and how we have uh, been implicated, uh, you know, in the process of of, uh, of of the killing off, as people say, the killing off of other knowledge systems. Um, and so I always start with, um, I, as you see here, the personal is decolonial. Um, so my my great grandparents uh, came from England. They came to this island, and they they obtained land that was essentially stolen from the uh, First Nations people who had lived on that land before. They were poor people. They would not have left England had they been uh, well-to-do uh, or even middle class. They were poor people and they came, and, but they became, they got 200 acres of land and they became uh, middle class people. And uh, they, uh, and you can see that in this in this portrait, they're they're you know dressed very European, and you'll even see a darker uh, skinned woman with a hat on the back, and she would be uh, Halalt, uh, First Nations, an indigenous person who was helping as a servant to to the family. Um, and when they came, they didn't come and just take the land. They also came with the idea that the knowledge that they uh, grew up with. The kind of the body of knowledge they grew up with <clears throat> was 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 the the best knowledge in the world, and the knowledge which for fourteen thousand years the woman in that picture with the hat had been surviving on this very land, the fact that they lived for fourteen thousand years perfectly well, that knowledge was uh, was dismissed as a as a. Uh, you know, as a historic uh, fact, as um, you know, as uh, you know, as as a, a tradition, you know, as it, you know, and as a witchcraft in times, and so, so I, so, and each of us, you know, uh, each of us has a, a relationship to the colonization of knowledge, either as participating in the colonization of it or on the receiving end. Uh, uh, receiving or having our knowledge uh, excluded. So I always seems a bit uh, stark to start that way, but it's important. So in Canada, um, we have a, a history of a cultural genocide at residential schools and what they call the Sixth Scoop, when uh, children, indigenous children, were put into white families in order to give them a better, better life. And so we're we're living we're still living in a in a in a basically a colonial a, a colonial state, and our universities are uh, are predominantly um, and uh, I'll come to some uh, in some some uh, uh, some progress that is being made, but uh, predominantly uh, you know our universities, like almost all universities in the world, um, are dominated by a Eurocentric. Um, body of knowledge, a monopoly of European knowledge uh, over other forms of knowledge. Um, we do have, uh, you know, as I say, we're making some progress at our university and I just, but we begin with the, this is our, in our indigenous plan, we acknowledge that we, we acknowledge the role that educational institutions, including universities, have played in the perpetuation of colonial systems, both historically and contemporary times. So universities um, have been uh, have have been instruments for um, promoting European knowledge, and they have collaborated uh, in the exclusion of of other knowledge systems, including, uh, in our case here in Canada, indigenous knowledge systems. Um, but yeah, welcome. So how how did this uh, how, how did this um, the, the rise of of uh, the sort of domination of European knowledge? Uh, where did it come from? Um, this picture that you see there is is a, one of the colleges 
uh, ex at Oxford University. A number of years ago, I was giving a talk at this university in this college. And um, what I what I found was um, th this these universities, the Oxford and Cambridge and a, a couple of other European universities were founded in medieval times. And these were the times when what was uh, in happening in England, they were called the the enclosures. So previously to medieval times, people shared land wherever they lived. They were land based and they shared the land. They shared the land for grazing. They shared land, uh, you know, for uh, for for trading. Uh, they shared land for building. Uh, and, and but in the the Middle Ages, in the 16th century, 15th and 16th century, um, people began to acquire to realize that if you enclosed land, if you had the power to enclose land, that you and you then then th th those of you who who were able to enclose that land, then the benefits of that land would accrue to the person who had the power to put up the wall to control that land. And that process was called an enclosure. Now, how, what does that have to do with knowledge? At the same time, the same time as the enclosures were happening in different parts of Europe, um, you also have the, the beginning of universities. And so at this university, um, at, if, if you go to these old medieval universities, you'll find there's a, a very small door uh, they're completely walled, completely walled in, and there's a small door. Nowadays, they call the person who stands there is a porter. But in olden days, it would have been a guard. And so only certain people are allowed to go into that, to into that college. And so what happened is that knowledge began to be enclosed. And so the knowledge that was shared in a community where uh, a woman would be known for her uh, you know, her knowledge of, of, of medicinal herbs for healing broken bones and so forth. Uh, a man who would be known for his, uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, skills in building, somebody who would be known for their, their skills in looking after sheep. And, you know, knowledge was shared and it was open to everybody. But with the enclosure, they began to create a knowledge system, which in this in these in the 16th, 15th and 16th century began uh, initially supported uh, the development of, of the church, um, you know, as a powerful, um, you know, as a powerful institution in society. And later and today we know the state um, and and of course, uh, business, uh, you know, is uh, and so that what you what you have so with the enclosures on the land, what you have, uh, you you then became you 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 had land owners, and you had landless, uh, land owners and landless. With the creation of the of the medieval university, you had knowers, knowers, people who knew, who were who society thought of people who knew and those people outside of the walls of the university began to be thought of as people who did not know, whose knowledge was not organized in the same way. Um, and to some degree, that notion which you we, we still grapple with the you, you hear about the, you know, the word of the ivory tower, the ivory tower, the ivory tower um, is, you know, has grown up. Uh, from these uh, medieval times um, with the idea of the separation of, uh, of knowledge makers and knowledge keepers in, 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 in specific uh, specialized institutions and uh, separating them from knowledge makers and knowledge keepers who live in other parts of society. So I just wanted to show you this map. Now you say, what kind of map is this? <laughs> It's a strange map, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> this is a map. What did they use to, what was the scale that they used uh, to, to draw this map? They, what they used for this was uh, production of knowledge. This is books published, journal articles, um, you know, databases, um, you know, that are around the world. And so the larger the country, 
uh, the 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 more um, dominant that country is in the production of in the global production of knowledge. So you can see that on the left hand side, the large blue, the large blue is the U.S. The sort of dark blue up at the top, that's that's my, that's where I live up here in Canada. That funny little thing down below, hanging down below, which looks like a little bit like a like a lizard, that green thing, that's South America. Um, if you look at Europe, now look at how big you look at how big uh, uh, Europe is. Um, you know, it's uh, so so you can see is that North America and Europe, uh, you know, are very dominant, um, you know, in terms of knowledge production and that tiny little red uh, string hanging down below uh, Europe. That's the entire African continent. Um, and you can see an, an East China, of course, is uh, getting larger, but that the big dark blue, that's actually Japan. So it gives you an idea of the distortion globally um, on and sort of the 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 production of kind of official official uh, scientific knowledge. Um, let's see here. Next one. Yeah. Now I also so you can also see the the domination of of certain uh, parts of the world in terms of knowledge production. This is in the social sciences. So some of you, for some of you, this won't be the, it'll be, but it'll be similar. It'll be similar in health sciences. So if you look, these are the most cited publications in Google Scholar. Now, if you look down the list, you'll see some names, uh, you know, Kuhn, Structure of Scientific Revolutions is the, his idea of paradigms. Everybody's heard about paradigms. You look down that long list. Well, what are some of the things you can see down there? One one thing that you can see is um, there's only one. I think there's only one. There's two. There's two two women. Two women, um, you know, out of of all of those, and they're both co-authors. Uh, uh, Jean Lave Lave and uh, and uh, Susan Forkman are the only women on the on the thing. Second thing that you can notice is that from the global south, and I don't, I mean the whole global south, from Latin America, Africa, Asia, Caribbean, uh, all of the global south, there's only one person, and that's Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educational philosopher, who's made it into the the, the hit parade on on Google. So what you see is, that, and the other names are are they're all. Um, uh, Europeans and, and North Americans. And when I say North Americans, I mean USA. You won't find any Canadians there. Um, so uh, interesting, isn't it? Um, so what is this all about? The, you, some of you may have heard about, there's a sociologist called Boaventura de Sosa Santos, and he's uh, introduced a few years ago this word epistemicide. And what you can see here, this is the killing of epistemologies or systems of knowing by the imposition of Western knowledge systems. And so, you know, what he talks about is that that Western knowledge systems, uh, when 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 uh, Western, when in the uh, you know some 550 years ago, when uh, Europeans began uh, you know spreading throughout the world with through navigational uh, uh, skills and resources, um, they didn't just go to these countries and say, you know, um, here we are, uh, we're Europeans, we've got some cool ideas about how the world works. Uh, you probably have some experience, after all, you lived for 200,000 years and you probably have some experience as well, why don't we share? They didn't say that. They, they traveled to uh, Indonesia, they traveled to uh, South America, they traveled to Africa, they traveled all over the world, and they said, we have the a way to understand the world. We have a, a, we have a religion, uh, Christianity, and we have a knowledge system, which we call science, and this is the, uh, this, this is the answer, and we don't care what you have, uh, you better learn this one because this is the way forward. This is the way to prosperity. This is the way to modern life and uh, so forth. 
and they and in so doing, um, you know, they they <clears throat> they initiated the process of of epistemicide. So so uh, you know, I've been very interested in. So how did this happen, though? How did you know? How could this happen? So uh, Du Sorel, who's a uh, a very good writer on on uh, politics of knowledge, Du Sorel, uh, says that there are there are four things that happened in the late 16th century that 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 made it possible for European knowledge to dominate, you know, to to take this place in the in the world, and it's a domination which we're we're still living with. Um, first of all, um, these aren't necessarily in the right order. Uh, but um, anyway, one one of the acts is the uh, the invasion of the Americas when the Spanish and Portuguese uh, invaded first South America and later North America. Uh, they they were very clear that uh, in addition to um, you know to military uh, force, uh, they were very clear that they had to uh, you know they had to to destroy or to make it clear that the knowledge systems of the Inca or the Aztec peoples was inferior uh, to their own. And so in Cusco, in the capital of the Inca uh, empire, which in those days was nearly as big and strong and sophisticated as the European one, they they deliberately destroyed the what they were called the codices. These are stones which on on which the kind of the encyclopedic knowledge of the Inca people had been recorded, they destroyed those because they knew that if they could if, if they if they could make people feel inferior, that even their knowledge was inferior, even their spirituality was inferior, then they would be easy to conquer. And that that invasion, um, you know, and that idea of the superiority of European knowledge, which began in South America, uh, continued, um, you know, on up into the Americas as the British and the uh, the French and the Spanish, you know, moved up into what's now North America. And it continues to this day, uh, as I had said uh, here in Canada. Um, a, a second uh, act which you would you some of you would know about is the the expulsion of the Arabic speaking people from the Iberian Peninsula. You know, the um, Spain and, and Portugal at one time were, uh, uh, you know, were inhabited by, by, uh, by sometimes people call them the Moors, by Arabic uh, speaking people. But the interesting thing about that period is that there were huge libraries in, uh, in, in many of the Spanish cities, much larger libraries than existed at the time in any of the Christian uh, you know, uh, parts of Europe, um, there uh, the libraries of upwards of of a hundred thousand books at a time when when the Christian monastery, the biggest monastery in Italy at the time, would have had about ten thousand books. When the the Arabic when the Arabs were expelled by by Christians, one of the first things that was done was the burning of all of the libraries. All of the libraries full of, you know, of, of knowledge of, uh, you know, of non non European knowledge, uh, Arabic, um, Islamic knowledge. Um, a third thing that happened in the, in that as that we that we know is the 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 beginning of the slave trade. In order to in order to capture people, in order to take a person. You know, and put and treat them as a commodity, as a product to be bought and sold. You have to have the idea that these are less than human. These are less than uh, the people who take them are, are superior, and that the people who are taken are somehow inferior. And so the idea of that that African knowledge, you know, Africa. Think about it. Africa is the place where you know where uh, human human life began in the in the uh, the the Great Lakes basins of uh, of eastern uh, eastern Africa. Somehow those people had been surviving, you know, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years before European contact. 
but um, the it was really important and even progressive, um, you know, progressive uh, scholar, European scholars at the time uh, believed that uh, Africans were inferior. They weren't real. Uh, they weren't. They they weren't. Uh, they they weren't quite uh, fully human in the way that Europeans were, and that 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 sense of that deep deep um, um, you know exclusion and prejudice uh, allowed made people uh, feel who were uh, taking you know taking uh, people from their homes and selling them and made them uh, feel better that well these aren't the same as us so it's not so bad. Um, and that continues. Each of these, by the way, uh, the elements of 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 these of these exclusions or these epistemicides are continuing right to right today. And if you think about you think about recently in the world, we've had um, you know the Black Lives Matter. Well, Black Lives Matter, you know, is deeply you know has has implications for for knowledge systems as well. It's not just uh, civil rights. Uh, the other thing that was happening in that late 16th century is the, uh, the fear. There became a hysteria that women's knowledge, uh, you know, women who you know acquired uh, knowledge of uh, medicinal plants, uh, care of children, care of the family, and so forth. Th there became a kind of hysteria um, around you know women's knowledge. And um, and there there was a whole series of the burning of, of women at the stake, um, you know, in 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 you know throughout Europe actually, and e even into the uh, into North America, you know, a few years later, and it you know this so what you what you find is, so the result of these epistemicides is that that is that that you get. Um, the the rise of, um, of, of of Eurocentric male uh, knowledge systems that 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 now um, that, that now are the uh, the Western canon what we call the Western they are the it's the foundations of what we call um, you know our uh, our college knowledge system in a, in most of our universities. All right, so that's the that's that's the, the the dark and the you know that's the background, as I say, some of which continues to today. Um, but we are in a time of transformation, and you've got a riot club, which is I love the name, by the way, I love the riot. It's it's so so good. Um, the you've got a, a, a space which you're promoting the idea of open science, and um, open science, um, um, you know, and, and I'll, 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 I'll mention the the in very interesting new recommendation uh, that's come out of UNESCO. The UNESCO recommendation on open science talks about um, the, you know these elements. So the the what um, open science um, is means much more. Historically, open science has has dealt with sort of two things. One is it's been about um, you know open access, free open access to publications and data, and it's also uh, had to do with um, the idea of citizen science, where ordinary people might become involved, you know, in uh, science, scientific uh, work, research work, but. Um, this the the new idea of the the new vision for open science, which is now being um, uh, circulating and, and picking up momentum, uh, it includes uh, more than that. So it it means that science must be open. It must open itself to society to be more relevant, particularly to civil society organizations and social movements. Um, and it 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 means that. Um, science has to be seen as something that is actually being created, created and invented. Um, uh, my Mac will go to sleep unless it's plugged into a power outlet. Oh dear. No, oh, I'm just having so much trouble today technologically. Oh, excuse me. Perfectly fine. Yeah. I, well, I just got a note saying my computer is going to die. 
I, uh, anyway, if it dies, uh, <laughs> anyway, what a day. Uh, um, so uh, a recognition of knowledge coming from society. Um, and a third area of openness is the uh, openness to uh, excluded knowledges. So that's indigenous knowledges and cultures from the global south. But I would also include among the excluded knowledges, knowledges that are what we call epistemic privilege of those people who are living, for example, people who are living in, in extreme poverty, um, who are living uh, in uh, homelessness, who are living with uh, uh, different kinds of uh, abilities, uh, non non dominant abilities. They have a they have a specialized knowledge, and we generally ignore uh, people. And you can see to some to to some extent the idea of uh, patient centered health. Is a is a is one of the directions which uh, which comes out of this. So we're talking about we're looking for a, a fair, decolonial, open science for and with communities and beyond just open access. So we, you know, um, Rajesh uh, Attendan, who is my co-chair, we've been working with this idea of knowledge democracy, and uh, knowledge democracy is a, a combination of, of, uh, of elements and it includes uh, the recognition of multiple ways of knowing, um, which I've been referring to you know, earlier on, um, the use of, of, uh, of multiple uh, ways of doing research. So being open to doing research in, in, in more socially constructed or aesthetic uh, methods using arts based research and other forms of research. The way that knowledge is actually created in in society by people, individuals, families, communities and movements um, and also uh, uh, representing knowledge claims in, in much broader ways than just journal articles or conferences or books, um, you know, or, or even websites. But how, how do we if we're really doing important uh, work that we think you know has implication we've got to get that uh, out to people in ways that much much beyond the nor the narrow academic you know kind of, uh, of, of of production system um we also need to recognize that knowledge that knowledge uh, that, that that grassroots community-based knowledge is actually a critical element in transformative social change. So people's knowledge about their own situation is a key ingredient uh, to, to social movements, you know, for progressive social change. Um, we also, in particular, we are influenced, I think, by our, you know, by our indigenous uh, scholars here in Canada. Uh, we've developed a something called OCAP, which uh, is ownership control access of possession of research by indigenous communities themselves. So you can't just come in like in the old days, white people can come into a community, exploit, do extractive research, and then become big experts in, in this stuff and uh, without the permission of the community. So respecting indigenous rights for that. But for publicly funded research, you know, we're committed to as 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 riots, as your riot club is, to uh, free and open access research publications. So the um, so, so the sort of the research, the approach to research that that we that we've been supporting, and we have a what's called a the um, Knowledge for Change Global Consortium in the community based research. You could Google that sometime and find out what that's all about. Um, we, we are supporting the emergence of, of uh, hubs in different parts of the global south um, to, to do training in this kind of work. And the, our approach to, to this is, uh, is community-based research involves research done by community groups with or without the involvement of a university. In relation to the university, community-based research is a collaborative enterprise between academics and community members seeking to democratize knowledge creation by validating multiple sources of knowledge, promoting the use of multiple methods of discovery and dissemination. The goal of community-based research 
is social change, broadly defined for the purpose of achieving directly social action for the purpose of achieving uh, social change. Um, the, the principles uh, of uh, CBR or community-based participatory research um, are that the research questions originate uh, in the community or if it's an individual uh, person, they originate with, with the, the person or the family or, the, or in the movement or the organization. And that, uh, you know, our practices that found that, that um, developing a kind of collaboration agreement when you're, when you're first uh, beginning to work in a community uh, is really, uh, really necessary so that everybody understands, you know, uh, who, what's at stake, you know, who, you know, how you're going to work together, how conflicts will be resolved, all of that. And it also means um, discussing um, how, you know, basically the methods of the research, you know, that the, the community itself needs to be involved in discussing how you're going to generate uh, information and how you're going to share that. Um, and we also encourage openness to doing research and sharing with diverse approaches. Uh, we found that the arts and, and things like uh, community mapping or photo voice or you know theater or murals, public meetings, demonstrations, ceremony, and all of these things are, are, have, are really powerful both in terms of uh, as ways of creating knowledge, generating, uh, you know, social knowledge, but also as ways of sharing it. Um, and the other the other principle is that that we is thinking beyond the research project that the thinking about relationships, long term partnerships and relationships. If we're just, you know, if it's just, a, you know, we've got a you know, we've got a research grant for 18 months. We have to do this and do that. You know, I frankly, I'd advise don't 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 do this method because it's it'd be unfair. I think where there are situations where you have a long term uh, partnership or relationship with a group of people, an organization, a community, um, you know, where you can, um, you know, build a confidence and uh, in each other and begin to recognize that there are knowledge keepers and knowledge makers both within an academic and a non-academic setting those are those are key um effective partnerships um the the key to you know the key to life is is uh, res, you know is respect uh, re reciprocity um transparency you know it's so so it is with research partnerships that um, you need mutual understanding and you need to take the time at the beginning to build trust and respect because research in general has not been, um, has not helped, um, you know, in kind of building social justice. Research, certainly in the case of, you know, of, of excluded, you know, populations, um, you know, oppressed people, indigenous peoples. Research has been used as a tool actually against um, against a lot of people. So it, there's a lot of mistrust in community around scholars. So there needs to be a reciprocity of benefits. So why would a community, you know, be involved with a, a piece of research? Well, there needs to be some reciprocity. There needs to be some something some clear and we, you know, we often we say a written agreement, you know, is a way to develop that uh, financial transparency, joint accountability. So many times these projects are 100 percent controlled by universities. The money is all goes through the university system. Nobody in the community has anything to say about about how much money, where it gets spent and so forth. That's that doesn't uh, that doesn't help with building trust and respect. Um, Co-production of results, um, shared celebration of success, and stable extended funding, more than just project by project. So I, I say it this way, these are questions for myself. You know, I'm a, an old white 
a straight male. Um, and I, you know, so how am I, how do I, how, how do I place myself in the world? What questions do I ask myself? So the questions I ask myself are, how can I, how can I decolonize? I've been raised in a colonial, you know, a colonial, with a colonial uh, mindset, a colonial uh, set of knowledge values. How do I decolonize, deracialize, demasculinize, degender my inherited intellectual spaces? Um, how do I open up spaces for the flowering of diverse epistemologies, ontologies, and ways of knowing? How, how, how do I do that? And how do I become a part of creating a new architecture of knowledge that allows the co-construction of knowledge between academic and social movements and activist communities? And uh, these are, you know, these, you may find these questions helpful for yourselves, um, I certainly find them, and I'm as as I'm 78 years old. I am uh, still, um, you know, challenging myself, still finding myself challenged, still learning, you know, every day, you know, about about these kinds of issues. And uh, uh, I believe that we all can learn, uh, no matter how, you know, how, no matter what narrow idea we've had about knowledge. Uh, or how to do research before all of us are capable of learning new ways. Um, here's a few uh, resources for you. The the UNESCO recommendation. I'll 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 send you this uh, PowerPoint so you can have it. Um, our own chair. We've got a lot of resources, tons of resources on things that we've written and so forth. You can find a lot. And the the other group which you may know about is the. International Collaboration on Participatory Health Research. That's a, got a lot of great material, particularly for you folks who have a strong health bias. I think that's probably it. Oh yeah, here's a book. <laughs> here's a book which we just wrote to this, this, this year uh, trans, about socially responsible higher education. It is uh, according uh, in, in uh, uh, you know, it, it is uh, free and downloadable. Uh, you can Google it and uh, you'll find out where to get it. You can have, get a copy of it uh, for free. So I think I will see what else I do. I'll do. Uh, uh, how do I stop my screen sharing? Uh, yeah, should again be in the top right corner, but now instead of an arrow, there should be an X mark. Uh, yes, great. Okay, that should be gone. Okay, am I gone? I mean, my screen's yes. gone. Wow. Show. <laughs> we made it. We made it. Second All right. Please. Open yeah. to uh, <laughs> welcome uh, questions or comments or you know whatever you'd like. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I'm I'm really shocked to hear the history and the inequality in the world of science. We've been we've been talking about open science in terms of you know transparency, open access, but maybe just within the Western English speaking science that we usually see. And today we go beyond and realize that a greater openness to knowledge that come from indigenous indigenous people, minorities, and cultures from the global south are so important. Um, thanks, Professor Hall. It, this is a really a great reminder for us, and we are inspired by you. <laughs> and we, I think we got some questions in the chat, right? Maybe Laura, you can. Um, so yeah, I see that uh, there was a question about the map of knowledge. Yes. So it, it was mostly about when it was referring to uh, the year. Do, do you by any chance have that kind of information? I, I think it was uh, I think it was about 2018. When that map was made and I, I wish they would make an, an updated one uh, to see if uh, things are filling out a little bit in the those other, other places. The, the other thing I would say about the map, um, the, the map uh, is is a map really of um, 
of the production of really kind of Eurocentric knowledge. So, uh, it, and, and, and the production of academic knowledge. So, um, what what the map doesn't show is the d map doesn't show you know the the the, the uh, and I'm not quite sure how you do show that, but the the production of of, of knowledge uh, about everyday life. So, if you were going to talk about uh, you know uh, subsistence knowledge, you know knowledge of land-based peoples on you know how to how to live uh, you know their lives. I, you know, uh, on on their own knowledge, uh, then you'd find it in in a place like Africa, you'd find it big, because so many uh, of the people in Africa are are living, uh, you know, really outside the kind of the Western economy and living on you know kind of subsistence knowledge. So it doesn't show uh, it doesn't show you know all of the other knowledge, but it it does show. Uh, you know the, uh, and you were talking about uh, uh, the being. You were uh, talking about English. English is is another of the factors, which uh, it, which which is uh, killing off uh, knowledge systems. We have um, we 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 just began in January of 2022 the United Nations Decade. Uh, on indigenous languages, because indigenous languages around the world, and there are thousands, you know, five, six thousand of these indigenous languages are being uh, killed off uh, by by colonial languages. But English is the is the most uh, uh, is the is the most powerful of these languages, and uh, I'll just tell you that you know that what's happening that it's. You get the situation, um, you know, the the market-based publishers are uh, in 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 link with the university ranking systems. So university ranking systems are there checking on, um, you know, on publications that have been published in journals that are part of the the market side of things. Uh, they they don't give as much credit to open access publishing. So in a, a in a country uh, Malaysia, which is the one that I've been speaking with the people there, their Ministry of Higher Education has told their scholars that we want you to be publishing uh, in international English uh, medium journals. They have a lot of of journals in the Malay language, Bahasa Malay. The best of the best scholars now are being told, no, you have to go publish in, you know, a journal that's published published in, you know, in uh, the Netherlands or in England or in the United States, and what what is going to happen over the years unless we can you know we can slow that movement down is that is that the 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 scientific knowledge the quality of scholarship in the bahasa language will diminish but that's already diminished dramatically dramatically if you think of indigenous languages so one of the big big you know things around openness and open science and this new way of thinking about a broader way of thinking about open science is the uh, the uh, the revitalization uh, of indigenous languages and the defense of uh, of 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 languages other than you know uh, english i would say english is the biggest problem but uh, you know spanish is a very large language as well chinese you know but you know i mean you've got uh, in the netherlands you ha you've got you know a relatively small population and keeping uh keeping uh, dutch as a um as a scientific you know as a sophisticated um carrier you know of of contemporary knowledge is a challenge 
is a challenge. Um, so this is this is another element, and it's 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 part of the the way in which um, that word epistemicide, which is a very frightening word, the way in which that epistemicide is is uh, is is still being uh, promoted uh, in our in our universities. Thank you so much for the great answer and also the discussion about language. I can I can feel uh, the language barrier in in, yeah. in the in the process of spreading. Yes, yes, of course. And um, I'm sorry we are running out of time. I'm sorry for the uh, technical problems in the beginning, but maybe Professor, how do you have like five minutes for another final questions from our audience? Yes, I have time. I've got time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And so we have a question. Um, um, the question is, working at a STEM institution, I have heard researchers express opinion that decolonization is a social science specific problem that feels like uh, maths are objective and they are not biased. How would you respond to, the, to, the, uh, respond to this? Well, I think that uh, de I think decolonization of of, of 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 science, the decolonization of all of knowledge is what we're uh, what we're talking about. And let me give you a, a you know a concrete example. We are now in a, a situation where we're we are um, uh, uh, you know worried about and trying to do something about um, the climate crisis. Well, um, the Western science um, has been, uh, you know, helping us to understand, um, you know, the climate crisis for many, 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 many years. But um, the the, the um, we have the the Western approach to science has also separated um, the cognitive from the affective or the the behavioral so we you know that idea so it's the the head you know is where is where western science has been uh, but it's been it hasn't been at the heart and it and it has separated us from uh, you know from 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 the earth and from the land but where where can you find a a science that integrates those this is where um, a, a indigenous science, and I say indigenous science deliberately because it's not just indigenous knowledge. Indigenous people have had a, a science, you know, long before, long before Europeans, you know, European science is five, six hundred years old. It's nothing. Even my island, even my island people have been here for 14,000 years, you know. That's not. It's nothing. It's thirteen thousand five hundred years before Europeans even started thinking about science. So, and 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 these these other forms, these indigenous forms of knowledge, there's no separation between the natural world. We are see. We are the natural world. We are a spiritual world. We are, uh, you know, we are a ceremonial world, and. If we want as human beings, if we want to to understand the earth uh, in a in a way that's going to help us protect, um, you know, the the survival of, of humanity, uh, you know, we have to find we have to go beyond uh, just the the head. We certainly have to go beyond just a profit, you know, just the profit and loss, you know, the companies and all of that. Uh, and so, um, you, you know, the the incorporation of, um, you know, the the incorporation of indigenous forms of knowledge, you know, is is really really critical. And I would say that the same thing in in health. I would say that there is a benefit. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of, of 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 what we in British Columbia we call complementary you know, health systems. You've got Ayurvedic uh, uh, approaches to health. You've got Chinese traditional medicine approaches to health. 
There are, um, you know, various kinds of, um, of African herbal medicines, which are very sophisticated. Um, we, t t we li if if we limit ourselves simply to the to 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 the you know the Western um, you know health approaches, who knows? I mean, is COVID? Uh, what is COVID? I mean, is is COVID something that's come because we have uh, you know we have cut ourselves off from the, from a, a much more sophisticated understanding of health because we've you know our 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 health research um, has focused so much you know on on a particular uh, way of understanding uh, health. So uh, you know I and I. I think that um, in so many other other for other aspects of science that we we will um, engineering engineering after all engineering is a is an applied science anyway and there there's so many ways to to benefit from uh, you know from engineering architecture you know you think there's there's hardly a, a spirituality for heaven's sakes there, there's hardly any aspect of of human knowledge, which wouldn't be um, wouldn't be allowed to, uh, to to grow and become more sophisticated and and, and more helpful, um, you know, to to life if we did if we could find a way to open open it up to uh, a broader under um, the to that the full access of uh, of the knowledge systems that exist in the world. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the for the answers. Our our audience are very enthusiastic. We have three more questions. Is it, is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, no, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Then another question. In recent days, the Russian research communities are being isolated, and European scientists are asked for isolating them by their own institutions. How? Can we manage this situation, maintaining a spirit of an open science? Wow, boy, you're asking a hard question. I've uh, I've thought about this. Uh, I've been thinking about this. Um, you know, the, the my own my own city uh, the, of Victoria has just uh, uh, broken its relationship uh, to it. It it has. Uh, it has a twin city somewhere in uh, Russia. I don't remember the name of it, but the council decided to 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 break the uh, the, the twin relationship with that city. You know, as a as an act of uh, kind of uh, symbolism, uh, so that you know, because people are so um, upset at the at the the, the Russian army and Putin's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, but in saying so, they said that 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 particular community, or at least the people they were in touch with, were opposed to the invasion of of the Ukraine. And so then the question is, you know, should should you break uh, relations, uh, you know, with people who are opposed, or should you, uh, you know, Extend the relations. Um, I I think that I I th I, th I think that we need to. Um, I'll just speak. You know, I don't I don't. You can't think I have any. Uh, you know, great answers to these. These are huge questions. But personally, personally, what I what I feel um, I I would do is I I would maintain um, linkages with people who. Uh, who who share the the values who share my values and who are opposed you know to the uh, you know to the invasion of the Ukraine um, and uh, I wouldn't cut I wouldn't cut off you know I wouldn't cut them off um, um, I um, I th I think that cut you know i don't have no problem cutting off you know the banks and the, the sports clubs and the, all of that stuff i think it's important and i know and um you know and and i think 
putting pressure, you know, trying to create ways to put pressure, you know, internal pressure in 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 in, in Russia on on the Putin regime. Um, but I also think that um, most that we said the the world benefits when people like-minded people people who believe you know in in social justice believe in in um, in, in in equality and freedom and these things are can can stay together and if you think about historically you know all the global you know international movements there have been workers movements and public health movements and all of these things they've benefited by being buying together so I think um, I personally will will try to um, you know to 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 maintain um, some individual uh, connections with people who who are interested in you know for example in this topic of open science I I don't I don't see I don't see that my my assumption is that they will mostly be horrified uh, as we as we are you know as what's going on and uh, you know if you think about what is a peace movement a peace movement is everybody who wants peace and i i want you know the the the, the peace movement within russia needs needs support badly uh, and so anything we can do to support you know the peace movement from a uh, academic side is uh, i think important thank you for that answer i these are incredibly worrying times and yeah, okay. yeah, um well it's good to hear a bit of hope for peace <laughs> and the importance of individual connections in these yeah. Yeah. i think um i can move on to well a less a uh, loaded question maybe it's coming from uh, Andrew Thornton who says hi but it's nice to see you can you okay. <laughs> briefly on the complexities of uh, generating better knowledge presentations in the current age of uh, of mis and disinformation <laughs> thought you said that was less loaded <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you're absolutely right. Maybe I should have and hi, but nice to see you. Uh, OK, well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I don't know. Um, let me think. <laughs> um, I, th I think that. Um, yeah, no, there is a lot of uh, there's a, a lot of uh, of of. of you know, it's hard to know, you know, what what the truth is. And we recently had, as you've probably seen on the media, you know, around the world, we recently had a, a group of uh, people with very large uh, lorries, trucks, uh, you know, driving into our capital uh, city in Ottawa and staying there. Um, and, uh, you know, raising questions about the vaccine, you know, policies of the government and so forth and uh, but also you know they they also <laughs> had a proposal to uh, uh, to you know basically take over the government and you know they would they would be happy to run the government themselves these are people who are truck owners who are going to run the government and so it's caused a lot of <laughs> you know raised a lot of questions uh, for us because we we didn't. We thought that was going on in the U.S., but uh, we found out that we have some of the same same people thinking here. Um, um, I I think that the, I I I think that the voices that hearing directly from from people who are experiencing. Um, you know life's challenges for example we you know I, i've talked a lot about you know indigenous peoples you know and so in the canadian context you know um, not 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 depending on you know kind of uh, academic intermediaries you know uh, as the experts but hearing directly from from community elders knowledge keepers 
Um, I think, for example, in areas, um, some of the uh, <clears throat> social determinants of health areas, for example, you know, with um, uh, injection drug users, you know, in, in Victoria, um, we, you know, to hearing, listening to them, um, you know, and having them involved in, uh, you know, in research projects where they themselves are the researchers. They're not, you know, they're not the source of data. They actually are the researchers themselves. You know, it is, gives us um, knowledge, which, you know, which is we can count on, which is, uh, which is reliable and is, isn't distorted. Um, the same thing with people who are living, you know, we have a, um, you know, in Victoria, uh, housing affordability is a huge issue. So we have, this is a, you know, rich, a rich city by world standards, but we have a lot of people who are, uh, can't afford, uh, you know, any place to live. And, and so, that we have the we have there's a we have a movement homeless movement and they they organize their own research with homeless people as researchers and th that knowledge you know that knowledge is very solid you know and you can count on it and it's so i my my sense is that the more that we can um, we can uh, 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 encourage and support uh, the the voices of of people directly, and 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 get away from you know the uh, kind of you know, pundits you know the sort of the you know news people or uh, you know, opinion leaders you know people who who are speaking for them because the 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 for them people on either side either on a side we agree with or a side we don't agree with are, are one step or two steps or three steps away from the, the experience. So it's it's valuing and listening to the knowledge, experiential knowledge, you know, of people who are, uh, you know, facing uh, the challenges in our in our communities, I think is 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 a way forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for the answer, we finally come to the final question. So the final question is, does market influence or impact of our capitalist uh, capitalist system on science keep this inequality or biases in place? Should we focus on pushing back against this as well? Yes. <laughs> That's a short answer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the uh, j just uh, the, the the whole, you know, one of the things that did, I'm sure you've noticed, uh, I've noticed over the last, uh, you know, 20 years, the so-called, uh, you know, neoliberal, you know, globalization, um, the inequality has grown uh, and it's grown, you know, around the world and it's grown inside our own countries. So, you know, uh, Canada is more unequal now uh, from a kind of a income perspective, a wealth perspective than it was, you know, uh, 20 years ago. And why is that? It's, it's well, it's because um, the, you know, in this model, this kind of um, neoliberal globalization model, um, you know, these very large uh, corporations have grown larger and larger and larger. And, um, you know, and this myth that this sort of so-called trickle down uh, myth is is nothing more than nothing more than a myth. Uh, so generally, and and you know, and you just have to look at the impact of you know of uh, of the market on things like uh, uh, you know fossil fuels. And, and now we've got this war, and now I can tell you that the oil producers in Canada are are ex so excited. They're so happy because now they can, you know, drill more oil. They can do all of the stuff which we've been fighting and fighting for years. So now, now the war comes and boom, you know, lots of oil production is going crazy. The price of oil, they're all getting rich now. So, but let's just stick to the uh, uh, academic knowledge production. They, there are, I think, five, um, you know, market-based uh, publishing conglomerates, Kluwer, you've got one in, at least one in the, in the Netherlands, 
Uh, they've got, you know, they're in the UK and the US. Uh, they, they and they own uh, so 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 many of the uh, the all the journals, and they control publishing companies. And this is exploitation. I mean, you know, there's two things that are happening. One is that uh, your labor, you are young scholars, your labor, you you produce knowledge, you put it into one of those journals. They will they will sometimes make you pay. Uh, if you want to share your journal article with somebody else outside of the their subscription, um, they don't they don't give you anything. You you do all the labor. Nowadays you have to camera ready copy. It has to be perfect. They don't even do technical editing anymore. Uh, they they sell it and they own. They most of these journals they copyright the stuff in the journal. They copyright it. That's your it's your intellectual property. So you are providing free labor to you know to companies. Publishing companies are amongst the most profitable of the capitalists in the capitalist world. And you you guys, all of you young scholars, you are you know. So um, now then the other side of it is that the, that the cost you know of the journal for for people who don't have who aren't rich, um, you know, most of the world. And in fact, most of us, I can't even afford. I'm a rich, you know, professor. You know, I can't afford. To, you know, books, books are are costing, you know, something like 150 euros. You know, <laughs> what? How? 150 euros for a book? You know, give me a break. So the so this is this is a this form the the publishing as a form of of capitalist exploitation uh, is just criminal and we participate in it uh you know to the extent that we we publish you know in those kinds of places and uh and that but that's that's a place that we can where you know where each of you each of us you know we can we can make a difference because there really is a, a robust you know open access free open access uh, publishing world that is emerging you know the Directory of Open Access Journals, with you probably know that organization. They have over 16,000 open access journals, and there are a lot of publishing companies now that are moving this way. So if if you if you if you uh, if you agree, you know, not to publish in those places, um, then it there it's going to make a change, and we we have to fight uh, inside our universities because you know university career advancement sometimes is linked to publishing in certain category of journals and we have to say no uh, i'm going to i don't want to publish i'm not going to be limited to publishing in that journal because uh there's it has no access so my impact of my work is going to be very limited nobody outside of a few, uh, you know, um, specialists in in the academic world in Europe or North America will ever see this, um, and nobody in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, nobody will ever have access because it's we've the paywall, the the the, the, the pr we've priced it out of access. So I insist on publishing where I my work can have the highest impact. So it's impact assessment rather than uh, this this kind of uh, uh, you know market based prestige for some journals, and that's something that we can all. That's why you, I'm so excited about your riot that you're make, making a riot with your clubs. <laughs> you can lead the way. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you very much for the great discussion, also the presentation yeah. and the honest about the publication system. I like the word criminal. <laughs> 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 it is uh, really an, an enjoyable, actually almost uh, 1.5 hours in, on Friday afternoon. And uh, yeah, I hope this talk can stimulate uh, further reflections and learnings from, from more researchers. Um, OK, again, thank you for being here and uh, hope to uh, see you next time and okay. uh, have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Happy second anniversary.